Well, a pleasant good morning to you all. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA, home of Central Washington University. I'm your host, Nick Zetner, the local time. Whoa, the local time is about 1146 a.m. And we will begin our program here on Thursday, December 14th, 2023 at high noon. I guess that's about 14 minutes from now. So there'll be a chapter titled down below after this in replay form where you can skip ahead if you don't want to be part of this live stuff here at the beginning. But it looks like we're five by five and we have um, 200 uh, at the start here. And we'll have a few more uh, roll in uh, as we get warmed up here and ready for another session. So here's to you for joining us live, the live viewers, remembering to join us live. Here's to you, live viewers. Where are you viewing from on this gloomy? Yeah, let me give you, let me a quick shot here. So um, snow is still gone, uh, very quiet weather here. And uh, Every day is about the same, kind of overcast, kind of gloomy. Uh, of course, uh, sunrise at like 7.30 in the morning, and then it's dark by 4.30 in the afternoon. Not complaining. I know it's much more extreme if you're farther north than we are here in Ellensburg. Okay. Riverton, Illinois, and Wenatchee, Washington, Georgia, Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm just reading the... Uh, the iPad here, I'm getting used to using it uh, as a little side piece here. Joliet, Illinois, Edmonds, Washington, Lake Wenatchee, Washington, Cincinnati, Ohio, North Carolina, Petersburg, Alaska, Webb Lake, Wisconsin, Kansas City, Missouri, Farmington, New Mexico, Worthing, England, Cache Creek, B.C., British Columbia, in other words, Omaha, Nebraska, thank you, Peyton Manning, Still Budapest, Zoltan is still in Budapest, Hungary, Dagendorf, Germany, hello, Plain, Washington, that's Rachel, hello, Rachel, Dorset, UK, Quilcene, Washington, Stockton, California, Deering, Kansas, Gilbert, Arizona, let me read a few more and then I think we'll email, I'll email the guest right away so he has time, you know, I'll do that now, let me, let me email the guest, would you mind for just a sec, please, add the guest, Copy the link. Send an email to Glenn. Gmail to Gmail. That's how I roll. And away that goes to Spokane, Washington. Hopefully, Glenn will be okay with that and uh, not have the trouble that Jerome had the other day. Back to uh, where you are viewing from. Waikile, Hawaii. That's Adventure Sombrata. What up, bro? Mission Hills, California. Ludington, Michigan. Some stray souls walking by the uh, window. Most, it's a very quiet campus. Everybody's gone. Don Fair, uh, Don's in Fairbanks. Minus 16 Fahrenheit now. High of minus 21. <laughs> Frank's from Brisbane, Australia. Have a good one. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Kirk from Philomath, Oregon. Uh, Julian, Austria. Hello, uh, Julian from Austria. Thought that was a town, but I guess that's your name. Derbyshire, UK. Kenmore, Washington. Springfield, Oregon. Sisters, Oregon. Uh, Sasquatchy Valley, Tennessee. That sounds like a song. Escanaba, Michigan. Hello, Linda. Uh, Julie is from Linz, Austria. Okay, well, good news, everybody. We got Glenn in the green room. Can you hear me, Glenn? Can you wave at me just to let me know that you can hear me okay? Thank you, Glenn. Okay, wonderful. So Glenn's in the green room. You take your time to get settled there, Glenn. Uh, we cannot hear you, just reminding you of that. You can do what you like, and you can even uh, 
share your screen right away if you want to just kind of get that off your mind. It's your call, Glenn. Either way, that's fine. So I'm, I'm glad that that worked for you. Terrific. Back to you guys. Let's just do a few more. I'm feeling extra relaxed, um, I guess. Oh, no, you know what I'm going to do? Let me make a, a reminder announcement uh, for those within a two-hour drive of Ellensburg. I made this announcement last week, but let me make sure that I make it again. So this is a very special event that's free and open to anyone this coming Saturday, December 16th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. It's not going to be broadcast, I don't believe. It's going to be only in person. And Randy Lewis is going to be making a rare appearance here in our valley. So I presume that somebody's going to have to drive over, grab Randy and Wenatchee, bring him back over, him spend the afternoon with us, giving this uh, session from 2 to 4. And then uh, as it's getting dark, Randy's going to be chauffeured back over to Wenatchee, I presume. So um, if you are thinking seriously about doing this, I'm sure it will be a memorable experience for you. As I mentioned last week, I think it's going to be extremely packed in there because it's not that big a room at the museum. This is, uh, what's the address? It's on 3rd Avenue. I guess you can figure out here. Well, 114 East 3rd Avenue in Ellensburg. The building looks like this. So I'm going to probably show up about 1.30 and I'll just reserve a seat in the back of the room because I'm sure that there will be standing room only and maybe even turning people away. I don't know. But anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And, and um, if you don't know who Randy Lewis is, you might find a few of the videos that Randy was generous with his time with me a couple of years ago. And we made a few videos um, featuring him and the, uh, very powerful stories that he shares with his culture, local Native American elder, tribal elder. Well, let's do a few more, and then I'm going to take a walk. Looks like Glenn, I, Glenn not only can hear me, I can see Glenn in the live picture of Glenn in the green room. I'm just basically talking to him, but I can also see his shared screen. So it looks like we're in good shape there. Uh, Randy is doing okay lately, Brandon. Thank you well enough to come over to Ellensburg and give a talk. Ah, people are talking about Myron Cook and all sorts of things. Sean Wilsey, sure, yeah. Dennis is in uh, Coscob, Connecticut. Uh, let's say hi to a few more of you, and then uh, I'll take a little walk. I don't think I have any more announcements or anything like that. Do I? Oh, why not? Just for you early arrivals, let's make sure using do uh, Desky, whoa, using Doc, Docky, the desk camera. Um, we're back on our schedule. I'm glad that you remembered to join us. We have uh, more than 500 now. That's great. And our last show before Christmas will be this coming Sunday, uh, December 17th. That's Sunday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And then we'll take a little break for the holiday. Joel Gombiner will make his triumphant return. And we're going to talk about the Astoria fan. That's a that's a suggestion that Joel had for me even before we started this live stream series. So I've got some reading to do. I don't know anything about the Astoria fan. So we're going to learn from Joel on Sunday. Then we're taking a little break. Uh, but notice that I want to be back at it uh, right after Christmas Day itself. So we'll be back to our Thursday, Sunday schedule. Even the morning of New Year's Eve, uh, I have plans to, to operate here. Autofocus. Thank you. Okay. More than 500 of you continuing to trickle in. Let's say hi to a few more, and then I will uh, take my little walk. Gunnison, Colorado. And Tualatin, Oregon. Where are you viewing from, if I haven't said hi to you yet uh, this morning? Bastrop, Texas. That's Bill. And Brussels, Belgium, Forest Grove, Oregon. That's rocking lady. lady. Gunnison, did I already say that? Florida, Ephrata, Washington, Stevenson, Washington, Marion, Virginia, Christmas Valley, Oregon. God, what's with all the people walking around? I guess they're enjoying the fact that they don't have to walk through a bunch of snow and slush and ice. Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Littleton, Colorado, Marysville, Washington, Rotterdam, glorious Glenwood Springs, Colorado. 
Huber Heights, Ohio, Unexotic Tri-Cities, Washington, Warwickshire, UK, hello, Mark, OMAC, Washington, that's Glacial Scablander, Ken is in Madeira, Portugal, I can, Kirk's in Sweden, Dayton, Washington, Sharon's in the Malaga slide, Sharon, I've revisited all of your emails from this summer, and I'm uh, putting things together for the next show. Very helpful, Sharon. Thank you. Charlie's in Polson, Montana. Do you know Sky Cooley? Orem, Utah. Granby, uh, Connecticut. Silverthorne, Colorado. Clyde Park, Montana. Post Falls, Idaho. Templeton, California. It's always a thrill to have so many of you here. I was just thinking about this um, for some reason this morning. Like I was like, I wonder how many we'll have today live. And it's like, oh yeah, maybe the usual. I think we usually have, uh, we, we usually flirt with a thousand, don't we? Sometimes we go over a thousand people watching live. And then for some a new thought for me, like what's the biggest group I've ever spoken to in person live? And I guess it was some of those downtown lectures right before the pandemic where there was maybe 500 and it felt like a lot of people in the room. Well, double that. And that's what we typically have here. I can't quite feel the, I can't see the faces, but I, I can feel the energy coming through the, the iPad here. Oh, we got plenty of chit chatting out in the hallway now. And we have, hi. Hey, I've seen your YouTube show. Have you? Yeah. Okay. Because I always go to Banks Lake Fishing, and then all of a sudden I fell into it, and I was like, I know this area. Wonderful. It's a real treat to meet you. Hey, same here. And you're doing a really good job. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm doing something right now, as a matter of fact, so you're famous at the moment. Oh, wow. All right. Glad you guys Sorry are here. You. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let me double check that we're good. Glenn's in the green room. Glenn has his uh, screen shared and we are ready to go. I'm going to take a quick walk outside in two minutes. Thank you for joining us today. Are we five by five? I don't know what. Yeah, Brandon says we're five by five. Good. We'll see you in two minutes. Thank you. Let's give you a shot outside. Let's give you that one. Glenn, I'm thinking 15 minutes for me. I forgot what I told you, but I'm thinking 15, maybe 20 minutes for me, and then we'll go to you.
Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this episode entitled Brett's Google Earth with Glenn Crookshank. Really? Uh, J. Harlan Brett's used Google Earth? Of course not. He was here 100 years ago. So what's with the title? Well, you're going to have to tune in today to figure it out. But our guest today, Glenn from Spokane, is not a geologist. He's a viewer. He's a viewer just like you. Viewers like you, right? Trademark, copyright. So Glenn is part of this community. And Glenn has a Christmas gift for you and wants to demonstrate how to use your gift. And that's what we're doing today. I thought maybe we would just have Glenn come in at the end of one of these episodes and talk a little bit about what he's done. But we tested the audiovisual stuff a couple days ago, and the more I saw what he had in mind, I said, well, that's would you have to do a whole show on this, Glenn? This, is, this has to happen. So this is thrilling to be able to bring this to you. And I, I, I want to emphasize a couple things before we bring Glenn in. I think I'm going to be at this about 15, 20 minutes, Glenn, before I get to you. And I want to do two things with you. I want to give you uh, an expanded Brett's timeline. In other words, I want to look ahead just a little bit with Jay Harlan Brett's. I mean, we, we were just dealing with him the last couple of times in Seattle, but we need to look ahead. And the time is right for us to move ahead, to peek ahead into the 1920s with Jay Harlan Brett's. And the other thing I want to do is tell you a quick story, hopefully as fast-paced as possible, about the J. Harlan Brett's notebooks that had been residing at the University of Chicago's library for many, many, many decades and seen by hardly anybody until now. So those are the two things that I want to do. Okay. I got to check. I don't know why. I, I, I guess I'm distracted by a couple of voices in the hallway. Are we okay? Are we five by five? I don't know why I have this weird feeling, but can I just, there's a delay in the comments, but um, let's do, let's make sure that we're okay. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. Okay, good. Okay. So let's do the slideshow first. It, I just have a few slides. Honestly, I've got just, just a few slides. Okay. We're done with Randy's announcement. Um, let's go to the slides. I'll just do it like this. So, yes, we have been introduced to J. Harlan Bretz to this point in this series as a high school teacher. You recall this. And he was two years high school teaching in Michigan and four years teaching high school in Seattle, teaching biology primarily, and then teaching himself on the weekends a bunch of geology. And so we last visited with Bretz, wrapping up his Seattle teaching career as a high school teacher for six straight years leaving high school teaching, going to the University of Chicago, becoming a geology student really for the first time, and getting a PhD in a two-year span, and getting the PhD in 1913. We will, in the next episode, go back to the kind of uh, careful march through time, and I'll have a few nuggets from his one and only year as the University of Washington as a professor, and then how he got back to the University of Chicago. But that's not what I want to do today. Today, I want to blow past, well, quit my email, first of all. Today, I want to blow past this Puget Loeb business. I want to blow past the University of Chicago. I want to blow past more of the stories about his whole career and then retiring. And that's all coming. That's all coming after Christmas. But this is what I want to pause on right now. We're going to get a lot of dates from Glenn. We're going to get a lot of detail from Glenn today as we go to Google Earth. And these are the most broad strokes on where Brett's is doing his summer field work with his University of Chicago students. And there's plenty of detail that I have not yet figured out. But in the most broad way of telling the story, this decade, more or less, Brett's is in the Columbia River Gorge. And this is the Columbia River Gorge. This is the Columbia River Gorge that is upstream of Portland, Oregon. This is between Tri-Cities and southern, southern Washington all the way down to Portland, Oregon. It's basically the state line between Washington and Oregon, the Columbia River Gorge. Hood River, uh, the Dalles, Bingen, Antico all this kind of stuff. Okay, So that's where Brett's is with his students. That might be a surprise to you. But for pre-1922, he's coming out to the gorge every summer and doing work. 
with his students. But once we get to 1922, and of course I've been flirting with this the whole winter so far, once we get to 1922, there is a solid decade where Brett's is almost every summer in eastern Washington in the channeled scablands. Okay. So, my other thing I'm doing before we bring Glenn is, is telling a quick story about what I said into the camera back in May. I'll make it quick. Make it quick. Here we go. I said into the camera as I was reading some Brett's papers, and by the way, let's just go there real quick. So, if you have yet to go to nicksetner.com, there's the word floods in the upper right-hand corner. Most of you know this by now. But today, really for the first time, we're clicking on this word, Brett's. And there's a whole treasure trove of stuff under Brett's. And we'll be going there today with Glenn. But let me click on floods one more time. And these are some of the papers we were looking at in the last episode with Jerome Lessman. In fact, we, did, we barely even looked at the papers, but we were talking about the work of Brett's. So all of this stuff is there for you, including the big... Brett's Manifesto of 1913, where it's this incredible old PhD dissertation with all these beautiful maps. If you haven't yet gone, that's where that stuff is. And by the way, uh, I tossed in a Juan de Fuca Loeb paper that comes quite a bit later, but it ties nicely with the Puget Loeb. So that's a new addition to this place. And I heard from Trevor Contreras, Washington Geological Survey, since the last show, and he reminded me that I could easily just upload Daniel Coe's beautiful PDF with the LIDAR of Puget Lowland. So this is available for you to download and to zoom into and do all sorts of stuff on your computer. Okay, so what's my point in going to this? Well, I was teaching my students last spring, and we were reading some of the J. Harlan Brett's papers from the 1920s. Fine. Those papers have been known and available to people around the world for a long, long time. And I looked into the camera as I was making a video back in May, probably, and I said something like, it's fun to read these papers finally in detail about Brett's in the 1920s in eastern Washington, but I would really love to be able to know exactly where Brett's was each summer. And what was the day of the week? And, and what field notes did he have? And I said into the camera, I, I think I've heard that there are some field notebooks that Brett's family donated to the University of Chicago for safekeeping. And this is me talking into the camera in, in, in May or June. I said, I don't think I'm that into it, where I actually fly to Chicago and like find these notebooks and uh, you know take my notes. But I knew that those notebooks existed. Okay. Well, Ryan in Springfield, Illinois, a viewer... No, this is part of our community. Ryan said, I got a spare day. I think I'm going to drive from Springfield, Illinois, up to downtown Chicago. I'm going to try to find this library, talk to the staff people, see if they'll let me take a look at some of these notebooks, and maybe I can snap a couple photos of the notebooks with my iPhone and send them to Nick. And that's exactly what Ryan in Springfield, Illinois, did in early summer. And I was so excited, I put those notebooks on my website. I made a whole nother column. Brett's. And I started taking scans and photos of notebooks of Brett's and started putting them under this heading Brett. So that's been there all summer, whether you know it or not. Brian from Portland, Oregon, got inspired by Ryan in Springfield, Illinois. And Brian said, well, I'm a descendant of Thomas Large, a Spokane high school teacher. I've already dealt with that library staff. Maybe I'll contact the same folks, but I won't go to Chicago. Maybe I'll just ask if I can pay to have somebody on the staff, the library there, scan some of those typed field notes that Brett's put together. And they did. And so then... Brian in Portland, Oregon, sent me all those professional scans. So then we, we replaced Ryan's photos with Brian's scans of the summers of 1922 through 1926. There's more to the story. Keep it going, boy. Keep it going. Glenn in Spokane, who you are about to meet, started looking at these notebooks, and he said, 
this is pretty cool. I think that I can take a bunch of this data in these notebooks and put the data into Google Earth. And maybe if I do that enough for myself, I'll be able to see where Brett's was going every summer. And one thing led to another. And Glenn has spent countless hours building all this stuff on Google Earth for all of us to enjoy. It wasn't just for him. Maybe it was for him initially, but then he started sharing it with me. And then I started sharing it with others. So if I go back to Brett's one more time, if I go back to the column Brett's, so it's easy to get confused here. The stuff that we're talking about today is under the word Brett's instead of, instead of the word floods. You'll notice that Glenn has a little help document for people coming to this site. Glenn has Google Earth files for each summer that Brett's was out here. And there's scans of field books and there's scans of field notes and so on. So without today's episode and hearing directly from Glenn, you could have kind of figured out probably if you're proficient at all with Google Earth and how to download KMZ files, which I'm not, by the way. And you could kind of teach yourself and maybe many of you have at this point. But there's so much that Glenn has done that I think it would be crazy for me to try to explain what he did. And instead of just having Glenn on for a few minutes, we're going to have him on for a bulk of an hour. And I have no idea how much use we will get out of all of this. I am sure there'll be all sorts of new ideas that are spurred by what you see with Glenn. I'm going to finish my story and we go to Glenn. So I started contacting the University of Chicago. Now we're into October, just you know, a month and a half ago. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I don't know how many people have been contacting you about these notebooks, but uh, there's probably been a few. And I'm wondering if I can order a scan or two. And the folks at the library said, uh, okay, what is this again? Why is everybody so interested in these notebooks? And then by email, I'm saying, here's who I am. And would you take a look at a couple episodes that we've already done? And, and the librarian staff basically said, we're getting a little bit uncomfortable. This is unusual. Oh, just a few authors have come to see these notebooks, and you're doing something very different. You're taking these notebooks and you're putting them on your website. And I said, I understand it's a little unusual, but I'm, you know, I'm not monetized. There's no profit involved here. This is just trying to get a lot more eyes on these notebooks. And it's all pure and it's all fun. And the library staff went back and said, um, unless you can get some permission from somebody in Brett's family, I think we're going to have to ask you to take those things down off of your website. You can use them for your own research, but to put them on a public website like that, it's against the spirit of what we have in writing for the donation. And so in session A, at the end of session A in this series, back in November, that's why I ask, can some of you guys help me find a descendant of J. Harlan Brett's? It's important, and I didn't want to explain why. Well, I'm not telling you why. I needed to find somebody who's a living descendant of Brett's to have them contact the University of Chicago's library and give us permission to do this. And again, thanks to this community, I easily connected by email with a grandson of Brett's, with a great-grandson of Brett's, with a great-great-granddaughter of Brett's. I just heard yesterday from a granddaughter of Brett's, and they are all very pleased and supportive of what we're doing here. And so we're in the clear. We're fine. And I'm telling you that part of the story because I think if I didn't make any contact with family uh, members in Brett's family, I think we would have had to take all the stuff down from my website, and I think we couldn't do this with Glenn. Maybe maybe all Glenn's work could have would just wouldn't have been able to be used because it all ultimately comes from these notebooks. So that's my story time today. It's not from a century ago. It's just from a couple of weeks ago, basically. But we are golden right now as it stands with all of these notebooks and all of this information that is available to you. Okay. 16 minutes after, that's about what I was hoping. Let's bring in Glenn Crookshank from Spokane, see if we're doing okay with AV, and if we are, we're just going to go ahead and proceed.
Let's give this a try. Okay, V, and if we are, we're just going to go ahead and proceed. Glenn, how are you today? Okay, V, and if we are, yeah, good, good morning. I've got to uh, get the sound working here a little bit. Uh, okay. so we can hear, I can hear you. Yes. Um, so you have your earbuds and just take, take not a not getting any sound yeah. coming out of yeah. the uh, microphone. Good. So if you can mute my output coming out of your computer. Good. So I'm so not sure you your, your headphones are working at the moment your with your computer. Yep. Good. All right. Well, let, let me just kind of stall for just a second. Um, Let's see if we could test the mic here. Are we running a test? Yep, we're testing. I can I can hear your mic just fine. Still can't hear you. You cannot Still can't hear, hear you at all. So let me turn my just fine. Okay. Well, I'm going to try this. Nope. We're going to get some mic. We're going to get some uh, sound uh, working here. I've got my iPad running too, so. Uh, okay. We'll work through this real quickly and uh, sure. figure out why my uh, sound doesn't work. Okay. Um, I'm going to hide you for just a second. Glenn. I'm not I'll able right to hear back. you. All right. So we're going to get there. Please be patient with us. How many do we have watching? 833 at the moment. Okay. So I think the problem is Glenn is able to hear me through his iPad speaker, but actually when he mutes that iPad, he cannot hear me and we'll just give it a try. So let's bring him in again. Uh, give us five minutes to work this out. Testing one, let's see we can mute. Okay. Glenn, how are we doing now? Are you able to hear me through your headphones? Okay. Glenn, how are we doing now? Are you able to hear me through your headphones? Nope, not hearing you through the headphones yet. Okay. okay. How are we doing now? Um, well, I'm going to hide We've you. We've got a little bit of delay here uh, on that. I'm not quite sure what's going on uh, with that. Uh, so, okay. I, uh, uh, I can, you can hear me. Obviously, the microphone's working. Uh, yeah. It's just the earpieces are not working. Okay. Uh, so, we'll, well, uh, we'll keep working here. I think what we could do, um, yeah, you keep, keep trying to talk, and I'll see if I can get this working correctly. Well, how about if we, since we can hear you okay, why don't we have, why don't I just shut up? For it says I'm working. Why don't I just shut up for a few minutes and have you try to, I'll bring your slideshow in and we'll just have you go for a little while and then we can try to solve the problem. Let's try that. I'm going to, I'm going to bring in your slideshow. <laughs> now we can see you're trying to get some help. Okay. Um, so here's the thought, Glenn. I'm gonna I'm gonna hide you, and you maybe just turn off, maybe restart your computer. Try, try okay, to. I'm, I'm working now. I think. I think we're okay now. We doing okay? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. I hear you now. Wonderful. Great. Well, nice job on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, there's a nice smile, and on behalf of everybody, Glenn, thank you for all of your generosity with your time devoted to us here. Well, it's been a fun project. It's been sort of a, uh, a scavenger hunt of sorts. And, and even though I grew up in Sandpoint and live you know, on the floodplain, uh, I learned a whole lot of new places uh, as uh, flying around with Google Earth for the last couple of months. So it's been, it's been good for me, too. Excellent. How about one more question just while the two heads are on the screen here? So what is your background? I assume you're retired. We've met just a couple of times very briefly. What's your background and how are you so comfortable with Google Earth? Uh, so, yeah, I'm a little bit of a ringer, I think, with Google Earth. I, besides being a news photographer and being have some experience in uh, digital photography, uh, I actually started working with Google Earth uh, 20 years ago this year, uh, back in 1923, or I'm sorry, 2003, uh, <laughs> when, when Google Earth was actually called Keyhole, and it was a uh, kind of a proof of concept. Uh, that got picked up by one of the U.S. intelligence agencies and funded there, and and I got involved with uh, tech insertion and and so forth. So I've been using Keyhole slash Google Earth for 20 years, uh, both in work and in, in play. So a lot of experience with uh, uh, with geospatial tools and things like that. Well, terrific. So so let me let me just be as clear as I can with the viewers. We're going to try to make this episode work for everybody. 
those that don't know anything about Google Earth, you've never even heard of it, all the way up to somebody with Glenn's background. And just a, a viewer note, I'm pretty basic myself, so I'm going to be learning a lot from this discussion as well. And we will have some live Q&A with you guys and Glenn. I'll just moderate like we normally do. But Glenn, let's just go ahead then. That's a great introduction. I'm glad we worked out the bug there. Let me bring your, your screen in and let's just have you get rolling. Sure. Yeah, I thought I would do basically two things, uh, walk through what we did with the, with the Brett's notes as well as uh, uh, give everyone an introduction to Google Earth uh, or for those who have already used it. Uh, but what I wanted to do, though, is, uh, is first of all go back to the, back to the website uh, and, and start with a couple things here, uh, reading these papers. The, the 28th paper uh, was particularly interesting and in why maybe Google Earth is a good idea. Uh, but this, this paragraph uh, really struck me uh, uh, with, uh, with what, uh, what we can do with Google Earth and, uh, and uh, uh, what, how Brett's could have used it 100 years ago. Uh, and, and this particular problem or geologic problem with, uh, uh, with Brett's trying to solve what he can see on the ground is really kind of great to, to view it from satellite. But, uh, you know, he can see, uh, years ago, uh, that, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, what he had to see from the ground is going to eventually we can see from the air. And there were airplanes, you know, obviously when, when he was doing the work, but, uh, that that's changed a little bit. You know, this document, has uh, uh, that you've shown before down at the bottom has these really wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, charts and maps mm -hmm. uh, that we've talked about before. Uh, and, and I'll switch back to Google Earth because Google Earth as an application uh, lets you uh, merge uh, things together and Ryan who was or I'm sorry Joel another one of your uh, re viewers who have been contributing to this yes. uh, just last week uh, or earlier this week finally overlaid the map of, uh, of the Google the map that I just showed you on the Google Earth so Google Earth gives the ability to layer on uh, different things uh, as you can see here I've clicked uh, on uh, uh, the map that Joel geolocated uh, uh -huh. on the Google Earth, and we'll scroll scroll in here a little bit. Uh, and th this uh, is actually pretty cool. Uh, realizing that the underlying image here, uh, I sent you a, a a document to take a look at, but uh, in nineteen in the early nineteen seventies, the uh, uh, first Landsat images were, first Landsat satellites were, were put up and started to deliver back, uh, uh pictures of space. And Landsat actually, uh, flew at about 500 or 700 miles or so. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 560 miles. So here's a view of the channel scab lands from about, well, I, I just picked 540 miles up. Uh, but this is kind of what the satellites see. Uh, from uh, from from the very first Landsat satellites that were uh, uh, that were put up uh, by the, by NASA, and you can see down at the bottom here that NASA has a credit for the images. If I show go back to show uh, th that map again, what we can do with Google Earth, and this is kind of cool, is I can change the transparency of this map so we can see. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, we wow. zoom in. How close he got to getting it right. <laughs> it's just absolutely amazing as I as I bring that map in and you can zoom in here uh, and just see how he did those channels. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, so th that's that's kind of one of the power of, of, of starting to merge some of this data together. And, uh, and you can see uh, how that all that all works. So okay, we'll, we'll come back. Let me, let me right. step in right here. Uh, I'm going to pull that off the screen for just a sec. Two things. Love yeah. this so far. That was a, that was a nice moment, Glenn. Um, I'm going to read that passage in that Sonicsing book that you suggested that I do. And while I read that, if you know how to adjust your microphone volume, you're pretty hot right now and kind of distorted. If, if it's not an obvious thing to you, we'll just leave it alone. But 
if you know how to just turn your mic down a little bit, that would be a wonderful thing. So I'll let you fiddle with that for just a second. I'm going to hide you for just a sec. And viewers, Glenn emailed me this morning and said, hey, can you read just a page from Brett's Flood? If, if you don't have this book, this is uh, the book that inspired me to get rolling again with the Brett stuff. And so here we are on page 237. And I'll just try to read this kind of quickly. Insofar as the channeled scablands were concerned, the existence of landsite satellites meant that the anastomosing channels of the scablands could now be viewed with crystal clarity from more than 500 miles above the Earth. Remarkably, these photos provided to be nearly identical to Brett's earliest maps of the scablands which had been drawn only after weeks and weeks of exploring the region on foot and painstakingly recording topographic features and taking measurements. Although perhaps not necessarily so now, the images were a boon to Brett's credibility, which shot skyward when the accuracy and detail of his early representations of the region were verified by these remarkable satellite images. And... Sounds like Sonicson and Glenn have been emailing just a bit, and Sonicson didn't get to Chicago. When he wrote this book, he didn't get access to these notes. So I think we are talking about just a handful of people who have seen these precious notebooks, which you can now easily get to on the website. Okay, young man, let's see if that's any better. Did you make an adjustment on your mic? Um, I'm just going to tone it down a little bit. I've been uh, I've been told before that I might speak too loudly, so we'll just keep we'll keep the volume down a little bit. The the, the adrenaline gets going. I, I got the same thing, man. Once I get rolling, I'm like a <laughs> shot out of a cannon. So this is this is, this is great. Let's get into a nice zone. Let's, I'll bring your slide screen back in and let's just keep going. You're doing a beautiful job, Glenn. Okay, uh, so let's uh, a couple of things. Uh, that I want to get to on doing the files. Right. So what I did, uh, again, is to look through all of the field notes that, that you posted uh, to, uh, to the Brett site uh, and then created a Google Earth place name file for each one. So for the viewers who want to play along at home, uh -huh. uh, what you want to do is make sure that you download every one of the uh, Google Earth uh, notebooks. So you just really have to click on them, uh, and you'll save this, uh, uh, save all these files, the KMZ files, to your uh, 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 to your local hard drive. Uh, okay. Trivia note: uh, the KMZ. Uh, which is the file extension stands for keyhole markup language is where <laughs> we heard that term before. So, so again, keyhole traces back to an earlier uh, series of satellites that, uh, uh, that trace back to their origins of, uh, of Google earth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's just a, a you, you can win a trivia game for what does the KML stand for? Sure. Uh, so you'll want to download every one of the uh, Google earth files. Okay. Uh, also, while you're here, go ahead and grab this last one, which is a series of topos, a topographical maps. These are sort of low res, uh, but they're handy, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to those uh, in a minute, what, okay. how, how those work. Uh, so uh, when we start looking at those slides, I'm going to switch over to, uh, to, to what they look like. And, and remember the, the quote that said the, the, the pages are yellow. Well, these the, Brett's notes are yellowed paper now. <laughs> uh, and and you went on, so kind of what got me going uh, is you went on in m m August, I think, around the middle of August from your yeah. back porch and said, hey, uh, what the hell is Pantops? Uh, sorry, Patrick. Uh, and, uh, and where is the Cheney Brickworks? And where are all the railroads? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to answer those three questions uh, today. Nice. Uh, if you look through uh, his notes, you'll notice, uh, and I highlighted a couple of things for what I'm working on, but he had gone through and, and underlined, uh, well, there's a verb, but uh, he underlined the towns that he had visited or the places that he had visited. Uh, so what I went through and of the, turns out, 650 some odd pages of notes uh, located every place that is highlighted. 
Mm-hmm. So as a, as a reader uh, goes through these notes, uh, you can search for Tico, pronounce Tico, my <laughs> other questions, uh, and you can find, uh, and you'll be able to search back and forth. So we'll, we'll get back to the how on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, every every underlined uh, place is, uh, is identified. Now, uh, a little bit of a disclaimer here. Uh, as you, well, as you pointed out, I'm not a geologist and I don't even play one on TV. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, so some of the things that, uh, Brett's described, you know, are, are pretty, pretty self-explanatory and you don't have to be a geologist to figure out what a gravel pit looks like. Uh, but, uh, uh, some of the things that I have identified in here, I think they're the right feature and format. And I'll tell you, I've sure learned a lot what a four set bed is mm-hmm. and what terraces are and what deltas are and sure. what bars are and what fossies are. <laughs> There's, uh-huh. it's, you get a great, uh, a great uh, uh, geological exp- or education just looking at these places. So yeah. uh, bottom line, as viewers go through and uh, uh, identify or read these notes, everything that's underlined is searchable and, uh, and uh, you can find it in Google Earth. So that's the that's for the first note on that. Okay, let me step in. So yep. I, I warned you that I, every once in a while I'm going to step in just to give you a break, first of all, to collect your thoughts. Second of all, to check in with the viewers, make sure that we're on the same page. So what we were just looking at is one example of one of the summers of these scans of the typed pages. So Brett's typed those things himself. Presumably he would type on the way back to Chicago at the end of each field season. And so those are the pages and you're like, well, okay, so how am I supposed to find those? They're under the word Brett's. That's one of those things. So Glenn was showing us, you know, how to download the Google Earth KMZ file, but also right there in that list, are these typed notes. So if you're not a fan of the Google Earth thing and that's too much for you, you can still just go directly to what we were just looking at and read like crazy. But I think many of us, Glenn and I for sure, and many others, when you see stuff like this, I want to go, where is that? I want to know exactly where that is and what day was he there and where did they go next? So it's kind of a graphic visual thing. Go ahead, Glenn. This is perfect. Okay. All right. So uh, back up here a little bit. So first of all, Google Earth uh, is one of one of three or four different ways that you can access these files. So uh, I'm going to show you Google Earth on the desktop. These are all free applications that you can get from the Google Earth or from the Google website. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to be working on Google Earth Pro today. Uh, but you can also get Google Earth uh, on your on your iPad, your phone. I mean, here's uh, I have it on the on my phone as well. So you can load it there. You can load it on your iPad, uh, and then you can also get to it just just with Google Earth on a web browser uh, that looks you know pretty close to to Google Earth the application. Sure. Uh, but it doesn't have as much features uh, as uh, they don't have as much features as uh, as the uh, as the, the, the Google Earth program does. So uh, we're going to switch to Google Earth. Uh, and what you see on the screen, uh, left-hand side, is uh, all the different places that you or I have created. Uh, down at the bottom of the screen are some a uh, little bit of stuff about layer, layers uh, that show up, whether or not you want to show uh, pictures of the roads. You can turn the roads on. Uh-huh. Turn the roads off. Sometimes it gets a little more confusing. Uh, make sure that this terrain is checked on. It gives you a nice 3D uh, uh, look on that. So um, to import, the, to bring the files in that you've downloaded, you simply have to go up to File, Open, and find the uh, the folder where your uh, where the KML files were, okay. uh, and and just click on one and hit Open. Uh, and it brings it down into the uh, bottom of the screen that you can see here, uh, the 1922 field notes uh, huh. that came off your website. Now, just a little bit of a side, when you import these, it puts them into temporary places here, mm-hmm. uh, and you want to drag them up and move them above temporary places, So, because uh, th- the temporary is just that. When you exit out of the program, they're gone. Okay. Uh, 
So yeah. make sure you move them up here. I'm going to whack this guy because I don't. Uh, it's going to mess me up. Uh, the same thing works when you're in, in the the uh, web version. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, projects. These are called uh, projects. You can import a local KML file, uh, and you can go to the same uh, file that I just did there and click open, uh, and it will now show you uh, the uh, uh, the place names. And this is this is 1919. Yeah. So Google Earth works. Google Earth on the web works pretty close to Google Earth on the uh, uh, on the desktop. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, depending which viewers want, it just doesn't have as much uh, uh, features that uh, that I like to show. So we're going to go back to Google Earth, uh, uh, Google Earth Pro. Uh, and as I was talking about uh, in the uh, as the files show up, here's the so you can expand these. Uh, again, I've got. 12 or 1300 of these set up. So it gets to be kind of messy uh, when, you're, when you're doing that. Uh, but if we're to open the, uh, the drag this down, uh, the, um, so here's the, uh, the 1922 field notes expanded. Okay. As we go over here, we can see, uh, drag this, share this a little bit. Uh, you can see there's pan top station is the very first, uh, uh, place name on here. Uh, but what I did besides the underlying places uh, yep. is there were some other places that were, you know, kind of no brainer uh, ones. So he's, he talks about a gravel pit uh, uh, on the west of the track. So uh, guess what? I can to I, I've, I've identified a number of these places uh, throughout the uh, if I, I think if I would identified all of his places, we'd have four or five thousand uh, the one thing you do learn from doing it this way is this guy was, ex he was exhaustive and extensive, uh, in terms of how, how and where he went to look at this. And we'll, we'll look at that in just a, a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, but what I did want to do, first of all, go back to, uh, to this realizing that, uh, he did, uh, an awful lot of work, uh, by train. Oh. And this is a uh, this is a view of the Reardon Channel, which is one of the Scabland channels. Here we go. Here we go. And uh, and if you come in here, I'll, I'll explain what this is in a little bit. But I want to get you there. Uh, this is over by Reardon off of Highway Two. Uh, this train is likely one of the trains that he rode when he was back here in the 1920s. This is at a rail museum now, oh, but this God. train was. This train was active on the railroads in the area huh. when he was here. Wow. And, and, and that's how he got around, which is pretty cool. Uh, so he did work by train, uh, and he also did work. Uh, I'm going to switch to his, uh, these are the 1923 notes. Uh, he called it observation car platform geology. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he did a traverse. In this case, it's a traverse on the SPNS railroad. Um, he also, believe it or not, in, 19, in uh, September 1st, 1920, he took a stagecoach from Chehalis to Morton, Washington. Wow. They, I don't know if Uber, Uber was running stagecoaches back then, but that's how you got around off the railroad tracks here in the 1920s as you rode stagecoaches. No. This is, uh, this is Mount Rainier in the background here, but he was over uh, in 1919 uh, riding uh, from, from Riffle uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, Morton uh, by stagecoach. That, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing, at least. Uh, that, that's amazing. Let me, let me hold you up again. Yep. Doing great. So um, I'm just trying to keep the viewers engaged uh, to a certain point. So how many sites did you say you have manually put into Google Earth based on these notebooks to this point? Uh, about 1,220. 1,220. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, how, how many minutes per site? Like, is there any way to give us a feeling for how much time it, we're talking about? 
Oh, I think he asked my wife. Uh, <laughs> it was hundreds of hundreds of hours. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of these were really easy to uh, to do, but but let me give an example. Uh, let's let's start with the very first one. So uh, we're going to uh, uh, to uh, let's go to pan tops. Okay. Uh, and so here's here's kind of a, a little bit of a clue how to read these notes. Well, first of all, he goes to uh, Spokane Quadrangle. Is the, the very this this is this is day one, page one of 1922. It's, there's no he dives right in. Yeah, he works off the Spokane Quadrangle. Uh, so I've been using uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, there's a couple different programs that are out there. First of all, uh, railroad maps. So somewhere along the way, I'm not sure if Joel got this or I did, uh, uh, we got a railroad map of Washington State in, the 19, in, in 1910. And uh, you know, this is pretty amazing uh, just to see where the railroads were these days. But here's all the different railroad lines yes. that were running in the area. Yes. Uh, he is on the Inland Empire Electric Railroad. So we know that that's a, uh, a light blue railroad here Okay, is the, the color. So we go back over to, uh, to Spokane, um, and here's the Spokane area. Look at that. So, oops, hang on. Yeah. Um, so first thing uh, that I was doing on these is you've got Spokane Quadrangle. Yeah. Uh, so that's for for those who are sort of new to this. Hang on, if I can find the right screen here, uh, where I got this up. There we go. Come on, you can get there, Glenn. You can do it. Um, I've got to find the screen that I have that uh, sure. I have this yeah. showing up on. So bear, bear with me for a well, second. That's fine. No, that that. That Spokane was such a hub, my goodness. And, yes, many of the railroad fans have been sending me all sorts of stuff for the last few months. So thank you to all those viewers who have been helpful that way. Sure. So I this is a USGS site uh, top, called TopoView. Okay. Uh, but, but it is, has uh, all of these uh, maps from all the country at different, at different years and things. So... Uh, I'm going to go to the, this is the Spokane, Washington quadrangle from 1901. And you can see, uh, first of all, uh, <laughs> there's not much happening. I mean, Spokane's got a big downtown. Yeah. Uh, but this is the quadrangle uh, wow. for Mount Spokane. These maps are just absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a little bit of a mapaholic too, so this is, uh, this is, is kind, of, kind of fun uh, to do that. But uh, in, in looking through this, you know, you won't you see Spokane and, and Chester and so forth, but you see no Panop station. Right. Uh, but if we go back to our uh, our map of that, we can zoom in. We can if we look sideways, we can see there's Panops uh -huh. in that resolution. So between that and uh, uh, between this map. And a couple of hours, then I was able to track down uh, the Pan Ops station. So to go to any uh, location, you can just click it, uh, and this takes you to the Pan Ops station, uh, which is uh, uh, just on the outskirts of Spokane. You can see here's, uh, here's Spokane Valley, a few more houses now, obviously, but here's where the Pan Ops station was. Uh, at this uh, at this rotary uh, uh, in uh, south of Spokane Valley. Very cool. Hey, Glenn. So you're not only putting the green thumbtack in, but when you click on the green thumbtack on the image, that's you typing in that text as well. Sure. Yes. So mm -hmm. what I did is the the description has basically enough. In most cases, the prescription or the description of the place name has the excerpt of text that lets you uh, track to uh, uh, to what we're looking at. So uh -huh. if I go back to the breast notes, so here yeah. he talks about it on the hilltop quarter mile east of the railroad, uh, the schist and schiscosity. Uh -huh. uh, so we go back to here, quarter mile east of the Pantop Station, 
uh, the shiscosity. Uh, so what I tried to do uh, is Google Earth lets you save a view and a location. Uh, and so I tried to uh, contextually put the view so that he's talking about this quarter of a mile. This is a quarter of a mile from Panop Station where he, he looked at that place, the, the Pantop's gravel pit. Uh, so the text here is is not necessary so much to describe the entire feature and what analysis he did, but this is just enough to get you back to the uh, to the notes so that you can see north of the station, west of the gas station. So, holy cow! Uh, holy cow! Yeah. So that's the link back and forth, uh, and you can then you can read the notes uh, and go back to the place names. Uh, and know that the gravel pit or one pit mile north of Pantops is is this gravel pit here. <laughs> um, so we've done that for you know all of these. <laughs> yeah. Twelve hundred of them or twenty two or whatever you said, man. Yeah, it's twelve hundred. So Good what it, it, yeah, so what I wanted to do in the in the big scheme of things here is back out a little bit, get back to uh, roll out of Spokane and, and North. One of the things that was uh, interesting that I found uh, is again with with uh, uh, Google Earth, if you you can hide and show these places uh, from uh, the place names, because you'll see real soon uh, that it gets pretty ugly. So here's here's uh, one thing I was looking at, and you were asking about where did he go. Yes. So in 1919, he was kind of getting ahead of it. Uh, here is where uh, Brett's went looking uh, in, in 1919, starting to poke around uh, uh, these. He's over in Othello looking at ash deposits. Uh, <laughs> so he, he, he's, he's, he's pushing the game a little bit already by starting to do that. So in 1919, we can see where he was. In 1920, we click this, we can see he was uh, kind of, he got over to Colfax, but mostly in 1920, he was poking around over here. Interesting. At this, at this time, he was still, tr in the late uh, teens, he was trying to find a lot of information about the Satsop formation. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, I, I've, got an, I've got an idea, Glenn. Hey, I got an idea. Yeah. Hang on just a sec. So uh, I'm going to give you a water break for less than five minutes. I'm going to literally take you off the screen. The viewers are loving this. There's all sorts of wonderful comments. You take a break. I want to say something directly to the viewers, and then we're coming right back to you. But I'm going to let – Glenn, I'm thinking, um, can you think – how you can go when we come back to you can we do 10 more minutes with you a couple of your really wild things you want to do and yep. then we'll go live q a which will get you to some other stuff that you wanted to do but i think we'll we'll kind of be improv off of the viewers but okay give me less than five here just solo with the viewers we'll be right back with you okay now this is my impromptu idea in the middle of this thing so first of all, he could probably hear me, but I'm going to talk to you like he can't hear me. I mean, this guy is giving us a major gift. And you're like, I, I guess so, but I'm not quite sure I see why this is such a huge gift. Well, let me tell you what's rolling around in my head right now. I don't know how we're going to do January's stuff. I really don't know. And being able to have me fly around in Google Earth and visit these sites are going to help me put some of these programs together. So if nothing else, it's a major gift to me, as opposed to fighting through all these individual journals and these notes and other things and trying to figure out how we can kind of put the next half of the alphabet together. Glenn is doing a major thing for me. But of course, he's doing major things for you as well. And I don't know what's rolling around in your mind. I have no doubt there'll be all sorts of explosion of things coming from you and emailing me perhaps about 
ideas on what you want to follow through on based on all this stuff. So it's, I, I don't have the letters mapped out. I, I've said that before. I hope it's clear to you that once we get Brett's to Eastern Washington, there's many different ways we can go. I just want to learn new things and being able to teach myself some things as well as you teaching yourself some things about Brett's and his students and putting this story together. And where did he go after the ambush meeting versus before the ambush meeting? There's all sorts of storylines that can come out of this, but this Google Earth data from Glenn is gonna be at the root of so many of the letters coming from this point on. All right, I don't know if you heard that or not, Glenn, but like, we're very yeah. impressed with you, man. And, and uh, I want to engage the viewers. So can we do 10 minutes more with you solo? I, I love that Moses Cooley thing. I don't want to force them my hand now, but what you showed me there was pretty sweet. But wherever you want to go, let's go 10 minutes more with you, and then viewers, we're coming to you. Yep. Let's do it, baby. Okay. Let's switch back to uh, uh, to Google Earth. Oh. Uh, so I showed you quickly uh, where he was in 1919 yes. uh, or 1920. I'm going to quickly go through uh, – if we look, so 22 was his really big year, and we can see that he started doing that right, and he's right in the guts of downtown. Okay. Uh, we go to 23. He's kind of starting to spread out a little bit. Yeah. 24. Now 24, he's, he's down on the Snake River and the Columbia River huh. looking – uh, for bars, basically bars and terraces. Okay. Uh, uh, in 95, in 25, in 25, he's now starting to look for glacier stuff, yeah. uh, or ice sheet stuff uh, yeah. up north. In 26, uh, in 26, if I click it, where was he in 26? <laughs> oh, yeah. Go. Oh, God. Now he's, now he's gone up into Canada uh, and is looking around. Uh, in 27, uh, now after after his he's meeting, pissed. yeah, he's yeah, yeah he's, he's vengeance coming back there. Yes, uh, 29. Uh, uh, he's starting to look at here. He was running around the margins uh, looking for uh, water coming in from the side. Okay, uh, and then in 29, uh, he's uh, back up looking. Uh, where did that water come from? Yeah. Uh, so he's finally starting to work around here. Uh huh. Uh, so, so the the turning these on is also kind of helpful because, as you can see, all of the if I turn them all on, uh, it gets to be kind of uh, kind of kind of messy. Uh, <laughs> but but I think when you get down to the details, <laughs> uh, it spreads out. Oh my god. Uh, so a couple of things I wanted to show you uh, is you you were hitting about. So uh, the, the Ch Cheney Brickyard, uh, yeah. the, the the Cheney Brickyard uh, isn't there anymore. Uh, this is Eastern Eastern Washington or Eastern State or Eastern Eastern EWU. Washington University, yeah. Eastern Washington, yeah. So uh, I actually because it's only half hour from my house went, went over there. And I actually got a hold of the one of the librarians from uh, uh, from there, and who sent me uh, a picture of. Oops, here we go. <laughs> so here's what the brickyard looked like. Uh -huh. Not a lot of help. Uh, here's another picture of the of the brickyard uh, that uh, it was kind of an idealized the the brickyards up here in the uh, quarter, yep. uh, but. Uh, and then uh, they actually sent me uh, drawings of where the, uh, uh, if I can get this to come up on the screen, there's where the, ah, where the brickyard actually was uh, was showing up. So there's a map that shows the actual, oh, actual yeah. Yeah. location of the brick and tile. But it's gone. Uh, but still flying up there, uh, get back to my screen, uh, I've looked around uh, a little bit further here, but one thing, when, when you start putting them all together, you start seeing other go stuff going on. So in 26, like, huh, what's this Cheney Mammoth site mm -hmm. uh, that he has? What's going on there? And it turns out uh, that there was a, a mammoth 
I need to spell mammoth correctly, uh, <laughs> that they identify here. So one of the things with Google Earth uh, lets you do is there is a time slider. If you look at the little clock up here, it's, a, it's effectively a time machine. And it lets you show imagery from different different dates and time. Uh, and this is the, the, the basically the place where that mammoth site, just outside of Cheney on a hillside. Yeah. But what you can do is you scroll the thing back and you actually can see there's, an, there's a hole there still. Uh, <laughs> there's always been digging uh, for that mammoth site. No <laughs> That's shit. pretty darn cool. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> One of the other things that you can do. So, time machine is real helpful to uh, to to uh, to see changes uh, in uh, in the landscape, but also you know there's no trees here now, or the trees are a lot smarter. So, this calendar thing is pretty handy to to do that. Mm -hmm. One of the other things uh, is uh, uh, that you can do. Now, this is uh, uh, he was over by Underwood. This is on the. You can see this is on the Columbia River. Turn this around, and we're 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 on the north side of the Columbia, mm -hmm. across from from Hood River. Yeah, uh, but he's talking about in his notes about this this hillside, the over in the right hand corner. This is this is called Pegman. I guess it's because it's supposed to look like a clothespin or something, but it's a straight view capability that you can drag down on top of. Uh, on, if any road that shows a little blue line, it means that street view is enabled. I can drag this down here. And it will switch Google Earth straight into you know the, the, the little cars that drive around the city. But here you can see the the actual the, the actual landscape yeah. and the, the flood deposits he's talking about. I mean, yes. there, there's a, there's a, a geology structural mapping final exam question right there <laughs> is to map all that stuff. <laughs> so you know for your viewers who are 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 not here obviously and there's a lot of them. Uh, Google Earth can help you go down and visit some of these sites. Unreal. The, the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is, is the potholes. So, uh, and some of the tools. So the, the potholes were I don't know, one of the uh, uh, major uh, things that got him uh, going. Yep. Uh, with Google Earth, besides, as you probably saw before, uh, I can bring in uh, topographical maps to sit on top of this. Better show that. Come on. And what it does is I can overlay a topographical map on top of uh, this area, and I can then see this, these, this, and this is the 19, uh, 1909 map. So a lot, a lot of detail, but here's here's what got him going. Uh, which is pretty darn interesting. Yeah, uh, and you can turn it on and off, and you can see that the, the topographical uh, capabilities. Uh, but I'm going to one of the really the, the cool things about uh, uh, Google Earth. So, so Brett's spent an awful lot of time uh, looking at erratics to figure out water levels. And he spent an awful lot of time uh, mapping uh, elevations and things like that to figure out uh, where the water was going. And if you could remember uh, from uh, some of his discussions, he talked, this is the Othello Prairie. We're looking east right now. Google Earth has a tool it's called the Polygon tool. And if I click up here, it lets me move this kind of out of the way. I'm going to drag a draw a kind of a circle around this area, kind of yeah. ugly circle, but whatever. I'm going to change the color to kind of a light blue, maybe, and I'm going to change the opacity to uh, uh, to to less, so we can sort of see through this. Mm -hmm. Uh, in his in his notes, he talks about uh, uh, the 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 potholes being at an elevation of uh, 1,250 feet, which is actually 390 meters. Okay. Uh, but he also talks about some erratics. Oops, hang on, I, I did that wrong. I got to do this again. I, I always do this. Draw one more time. We'll practice. Try to circle around that. Set my color to blue. Uh, pretty blue. 
Viewers, we're coming to you in five minutes. Get your uppercase yeah. questions ready, and we will uh, just have Glenn spitball off of your questions. I'm sure he's yeah. got more prepared, but we'll just try to be a little bit more interactive with you coming in just a couple minutes. So uh, I happen to, so you can change the altitude of this now and say, what would the water look like at three? At well, I'm going to cut cut to the chase. Yeah. Uh, at 426 this is in meters so you have to do this in meters okay. what it does it, it lets you drop water in oh boy and see where the where the water flowed i don't know why it did it this way it let that's i'm sorry that's why we're in frenchman springs Duh. yeah yeah uh, okay so here's where we're at the potholes where you can see how the water uh, uh overlays but it also follows up he's talking about up here, there were some erratics that he erratic. discovered on another trip yeah. in 29. Yes. Uh, so you can see he found water up to 2,400. Uh, uh, and so you can you use this tool to see where the water flowed. And uh -huh. now you can see basically at Orthello, there's Frenchman Springs or Frenchman Cooley. Here's the potholes. And then actually Crater uh, was another one of the bypass channels uh, for that. Um, so uh, the, the Polygon tool really makes it interesting to drop water in and see how it flows. And, and I'm sure if he would have had this tool, figuring out drainages would have been an absolute no-brainer. Uh, <laughs> so a, a couple other things uh, uh, quickly. Uh, one of the, the uh, uh, let's see, let me skip ahead to the, the to this talus. There we go. So, yes. So you uh, uh, had talked about in your uh, your ask from exit come on exit ground level view about uh, Moses Cooley in particular and I'm in Moses Cooley now and I'm going to spin around and uh, look at all of Moses Cooley. This white you see is just kind of a way it paints in the paints in the images, but you can see now this is all of Moses Cooley. And from our from our naming schema, we can see that in 1929 he was on the floor of the coolie. Yeah. Uh, and and the information. So on page, if you go to page 27 of the of the 29 notes, you'll find find the reference to that. Beautiful. Uh, Beautiful. And we and and now you can see that uh, all these various places where he was in uh, uh, 25, 22, 29. So he kept coming back to uh, to Moses Cooley. Beautiful. Uh, some for, for that. So that'll you can then go in and start saying you know how these things work together. Yeah. One of the things I was curious about uh, is uh, back to his paper. If we go down to uh, a couple pages down into this, uh, he's talking about the eastern wall of Moses Cooley. This is again the twenty the twenty eight paper, yeah. uh, photographed by Elsie Robinsons, who I think is. Uh, I think it was one of the graduate students that went with him. So I was like, well, where and when was this picture actually taken? Uh -huh. So I was able to fly into Moses Cooley and fly straight to this spot. Come on, do it again. Um, ah, sometimes it doesn't, uh, sometimes it gets lost here. I'll do it one more time. It's worth waiting for. Yeah, okay. there we go. There we go. There we go. So. So here's the Moses Cooley uh, yeah. at this spot, uh, and it pretty. There's, <laughs> there's the spot, and there's there's the hang. So he's talking about these hanging canyons mm. uh, as an indication of Moses Cooley being its uh, being its its thing. So what I was able to do then is to say, okay, so we found the spot. Um, where else was he here? So ah, he was here. He was in Appledale. Uh, so, so let's uh, in 23. So let's go to uh, the uh, Appledale, the 23 notebook, and we can see. Uh, uh, so I'm on page, I think, 23. So if I scroll down to. Oh, here's here's one of his. He talked about observation car platform mm -hmm. geology. I think we went there. Yeah. Let's go down to 23. 24. I thought it was here, Davenport. Do I have the wrong uh, 32, huh? 
dyslexic today. <laughs> uh, let's go down to 32. After this little ditty, we're going to go to the viewers, Glenn. Just yep. warning you. Okay. Right. So we can see that uh, that here's the cliffs of the Columbia Valley that he was through. He or the photographer were through here on August fifteenth, nineteen twenty three. Love so, it. Uh, so chances are that the picture that we just looked at uh, was shot on August fifteenth, nineteen twenty three. So so that's some of the kind of the research that you can do uh, with uh, with what we've done here. Okay. Uh, All right. I'm hiding that for right now. Take another little yeah. water break. This is, uh, it, it's one of these that I am going to appreciate more and more and more as the weeks go on. I mean, over Christmas break, I think many of us are going to spend time with family and f friends, Glenn, but there's moments that we need to get away from our family and friends. And this might be something that we do just to uh, get ready for the next uh, half of the alphabet. Um, Let's go to the viewers. Uppercase, please. I know you've got a few more things, probably, Glenn. But let's just let's just spitball off of what these guys want to do, and sure. and especially if you are a viewer and you are very weak in this area, it's okay. You're in a safe place here. You're in a nurturing place. You know, I I can ask the most rookie questions, and I have no problem doing that. So you should be fine with that too. Um. Oh, Mike says, Glenn, do you do custom work? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and, and Susan, we'll hold off on the geology questions for today. Susan wants to know where the water came from for Potholes Coulee. That's obviously a, a major thing we'll be working on, and Brett's had major contributions there. Les, are there coordinates on these locations? Absolutely. Uh, yes. So let's uh, let's back out of the one where I just said this was in. Uh, uh, oh, so every one of these, uh, I'm going to go to this. This is one of my favorite places to see here. If you've got this mm -hmm. up. This is at Corfu. Uh, yeah. And it is just absolutely beautiful. But so two different things. One is if you look down the lower left hand corner of the screen, it tells you, first of all, you're how where you are i'm eighteen thousand feet above here's the elevation of where the cursor is here's the lat long coordinates mm. also if you actually just open up the place name and look at the properties the very first thing here's your latitude and longitude for where this uh uh where this place name is mm -hmm. uh, additionally uh there is a the view from where i'm looking at uh, or where I've created the place name, so the heading, the range, the tilt, things like that. So yes, the 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 absolute locations are 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 there. Okay, uh, let's keep it going. Good job. Uh, Steve wonders, Glenn, did you make the photos yourself or some notebook years? Uh, are there photos that you've put into some of these notes? So yes, there are. Uh, the <laughs> we talked about that about uh, several months ago, yeah. uh, and, uh, and and that was when there were uh, twenty or thirty place names. <laughs> I was going to go out to do them. So as an example, here's a steamboat rock, and you had mentioned uh, the, the the so the blue and the and the green place names. There's a little bit of reason. The blue ones uh, I've actually gone to and. There's a picture of this big rock on top. There's there's our dog Daffy there. So mm -hmm. you've got a cat. I've got a dog. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Daffy's in the, the the rock as big as a house. Uh, and then we could fly over to the granite boulder. And here's the one that's sitting on the edge uh, of the of Steamboat Rock. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, it sits perched on this. If you've ever been to Steamboat Rock, that rock is sitting right on the top. So, so yes, the, the photos, uh, I'm in the process of starting to add more photos uh, as I get out in the field. Uh, there's some technical things that I kind of want to work through on that. But, but yes, I, yes, okay. short answer. Brandon wonders, does it cost any money to use or download any of the Google apps? Nope, all free. Paid okay. free by your tax dollars, <laughs> but, but no, Google is all free. A uh, couple people, Rick, or it's mainly just Rick, saying, "Can you show us historical imagery with the overlays?" 
Do you know what he's talking uh, about? Yes and no. Uh, okay. Realizing we historical uh, uh, satellite photos are you know only goes back to the 1960s or something like that. So okay. so the the actual uh, Earth imagery uh, is uh, is that. But as we showed with uh, with Joel's uh, picture and I show with the maps, uh, you know we can we can overlay uh, older uh, there's a way to over, overlay old images and things on top of the, uh, on top of these maps. Beautiful. Keep it going. Uh, Glenn, have you ever used a site called Mississippi rails to overlaid railroad maps to Google earth? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, that was specifically, but, but that's a, that's a, that's a great lead in question because, uh, Ryan, uh has so we were able to do let me turn this off just a little bit here sure. uh we're able to to bring in uh the actual rail routes that he took now again i got to turn this off uh, turn some hide some of these things that's the problem of all these is is clean, cleaning it up and keeping your keeping your view kind of clean sure. uh and i hide hide one or more one, one more but we can see here so uh the ah Hide that polygon there. Clean this up a little bit. Hide the twenty. <laughs> so you can see here. These are the. This is the uh, hide twenty two. So this is the. This is his routes yeah. uh, in nineteen twenty two uh, that he follows. So these are the rail routes, and then it's interesting to you can overlay then and drop the place names and see. So here is the route he took, and here is the uh, the place he stopped. Here's Blue Steb. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just these places are just out in the middle of uh, uh, out in the middle of Scablands. But uh, uh, so so there's the railroad routes, uh, and this is again a mashup of uh, various Google Earth layers showing uh, 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 what what uh, what he did, and then uh, what we have here. Yeah. Excellent. Um, getting a few comments from folks who are rookies. And do you have a step-by-step -step approach or how, how does someone get started on this thing? Did you, I, I can easily go to that thing that you made on my site unless you have it handy there. Sure. No. So there's a couple different, different answers to that uh, uh, question. Um, yeah, there's a really quick, easy, down and dirty Google, Google Health, but there is a, a wealth of YouTube videos, uh, instructional videos. The Google site itself has uh, a, a bunch of uh, help on it. So if you just Google, if you search for Google Earth and, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, Oops, can't type correctly. If you search online, uh, there's a, a lot of videos that you can use for, for that. Sure. So just um, go to the Google site. But just uh, let me hide your screen for just a sec. So, um, I mean, you, you're knocking it out of the park for sure. Like you, you should feel, I hope you feel great right now, Glenn. I, I it, it, Sometimes you're in the middle of this thing. You're like, I don't know, am I even doing what I wanted to do? You're totally doing what I was hoping that you would do. So thank you for that. The, anything beyond this is just gravy. Um, let's just try it verbally just for a second. So if someone has a computer at home, they want to give this a try, they first of all have to find would you suggest google earth pro or just google earth website which what would be the place to go for a computer uh the first step well so the google earth uh for the web uh just earth google earth for the web that's easy it's just a browser and mm -hmm. you don't have to download any program or anything it's just a browser screen mm -hmm. uh you, you have to download the kml files uh from your website but 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 that's it it's very very easy to to load those in it's it takes me longer to tell about than actually do it well, right. uh, so, so that's kind of what i'm just, getting at so if, if they get google earth on their computer whether it's downloaded or just a web browser then the second step is to go to brett's on my web page go to the first yep. thing that says google earth tutorial or whatever you called it and you're yep. telling them how to get those km or KMZ files downloaded into Google Earth. Yeah, here's instructions here that I showed up on the screen. Uh, 
so uh you know it's just there's there's how to do it uh mm -hmm. it's 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 a pretty much a quick cheat sheet but uh, uh but that's the those are the, the very basic instructions on how to do it and that would just you know at, at nothing nothing more than that that would get people up and running a little bit yeah. whether, whether they know what they're doing or not they, they can actually just start flying around and as opposed to i don't know my mentality as a beginner is i i I don't want to spend a bunch of time until I know everything about what I'm doing, but no, isn't it usually the opposite? Like you just start, you just start. Yeah. What, what, what happens if I click over here and then just, you're just, just, just as you go. right. One of the, I was going to point out one thing when you're, when you're in Google earth uh, and if you're clicking on one of the folders, for instance, you click on 1919, there's a little folder, right? down here in the left hand corner so by the way here's a search screen so if i want to look for tico uh tko uh, a uh, these allow you to search the place names unfortunately it doesn't it doesn't let you search the descriptions but it lets you search the place name uh mm -hmm. down here but if you're on the folder get back to a folder uh, uh that i can see let's pick the 219 for instance if you click this folder what it does is it starts a tour and it will just sit back and it will fly you. It will fly uh, right down all of the place names to where you want to go. I actually you should probably highlight it here. Uh, it will it will just sit here and just give you a grand tour. You don't have to even uh, lift your finger. Oh, wow. uh, just, just let it give you a tour by uh -huh. clicking this little button so that's the first thing you might do is just let it show you around and it just automatically will uh set the time uh you can set how long you want to wait there but it, it will just it will fly you around uh to brett's place huh. <laughs> okay and, and that's pretty cool yeah uh, you just use a screen sit, use a screen saver and just let it fly around because you you never know what you're going to find uh I want to show you one quick little thing here. This is, there's nothing quick on this, but go ahead. <laughs> um, this Corfu, and I, this is just kind of happenstance for me. So when you're uh, flying around these areas, uh, sometimes you want to check the places because I'm, I'm looking at this, and all of a sudden it says, what the heck is a Nike missile control site? Uh -huh. <laughs> Nike, Nike missile control site. They built it awful close to a landslide, uh, but they're just strange things out here that you end up coming and seeing. Yes. Uh, 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 but as well, Brett was excited about it uh, too. Uh, this this quote here. So some of the uh, uh, some of the quotes I went a little bit longer uh, just because of what they said. Where he's talking about the the final culminating piece of evidence by which the hypothesis will stand through all the storms. I mean, that's heavy writing there. Yes, yes, yeah. There's, uh, there's, there's so much. Oh, I'm going to hide. I'm going to hide you again. So, uh, unless there's one other kind of major thing that you really wanted to make sure we saw today, I think we're yeah. good. Um, yep. And we, you're gonna, you're gonna, Glenn, you're gonna love reading all these comments. These people are just ecstatic over what you've done here. Is there anything else that you really wanted to absolutely make sure we include today? Absolutely. Yep. I forgot the one, the one thing. Let's go back to uh, the potholes. Good. Thank you. And we're going to let me turn off a couple of things. Uh, so uh, there is a really neat feature. If we turn this around a little bit uh, to do this, and Brett was talking about uh, 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 profiles and things like that. There is a measuring ruler up here. If you click this ruler, and then you click path, and you can draw a line. I'm going to draw it right through the potholes there. Oops, come on. And what, and then you click show elevation profile. What it does is it shows you an mm -hmm. elevation profile of where you are. As you can see there's the two major drops that go off the potholes, and then it, wow. and then here's your hanging valley. There's a little bit of a fossa in there where it dug it out, and then here's the Columbia River. But it lets you visualize those. Uh, 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 Profiles, topographic yeah. profiles, right. uh, 
it very easy. So that uh, path ruler is a really handy tool to help you understand uh, how some of this stuff works. Works. So that's the last kind of tool, power tool that I wanted to show uh, with that. Glenn, you have done an excellent job today. I'm so grateful that you spent so much time with us today, and I'm sure that we will be in regular communication as the series goes on, and, and who knows what will bubble up from all of this. I think I'll keep your contact information private. I, I don't think you want to be slammed by all sorts of folks, but I mean, if at some point you feel like you want to handle some of that, then folks can go directly to you, but you've done a lion's share of the work here. And it's really up to us to just kind of take what you've done and run with it in, in the directions that we're inspired to run. But yeah. I think it's time for a, a ham sandwich yeah. for you and just sit back and enjoy. Yeah. I did. I did put my contact information into that, into the description. And the reason why uh, is, uh, you know, I want to get these things right. Uh, I think I identified most of the geologic features, but I don't think I got them all. And when the real geologists take a look at this, if I've, if I've misidentified a feature or something, let me know and uh, we'll get it corrected. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll probably have a new version of these place names occasionally. So uh, please, if you've got corrections, send them to me because uh, I do want to get as good of a product out there because these will probably be out you know, these things are forever now, probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so send, send corrections because uh, I want to get them right. Okay. Very good. Glenn Crookshank, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, we will all enjoy the fruits of your labor in the next few weeks at least. Okay. Thanks. Have Glad to do it. Time. Thank you. Enjoy the time with your family over the break. And we'll uh, check with you, with you sometime soon. Cheers. All right, Glenn. Bye-bye. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> oh, hey, the check yeah. this out. Oh, hey, nice. Perfect. You got Kirk from Philomus Mug and you got some of that A to Z wine. You got to crack into that yeah. now, boy. <laughs> it's after lunch somewhere. Very good. All right. Thank Thanks. you, Glenn. Bye bye now. Mm -hmm. Bye. Whew. That was Glenn Crookshank from Spokane, Washington, a viewer, a member of this community, and maybe now is the most, um, is the biggest moment to realize the scale of this community that we have. Um, we're all contributing, we're all learning from each other, but why, my God, that's a, that's a big step. Um, let me say a couple final things related to what we just experienced with Glenn. I think I'm going to hunt for a map that I wasn't planning on showing, but I think I want to show you. And then we'll look ahead to the, uh, the last episode that we have scheduled before Christmas. In fact, let's do that now before I forget. So we have one more episode before we break for the holidays. And that episode will be... Sunday, December 17th at 9 a.m. Pacific time, session J. We're just wrapping this one up, and here we go. And Joel Gombiner will be the guest. You remember Joel from a few letters ago. He'll be back, and we're going to talk about the Astoria fan, a submarine deposit that I know nothing about, but Joel has plenty to offer. So that's also going to be kind of an exceptional, unusual episode for us. Then we take a break for the holidays and I'll be back here. But the reason I'm showing you this calendar right now is to reinforce what I kind of tried to say to you uh, eyeball to eyeball uh, halfway through our time with Glenn. I try not to talk about my role very much. I try to just do it. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, then you go elsewhere. But maybe this is the moment or a moment to speak specifically about something. Quite often, all of this geology stuff has so much detail. There's just mind-numbing detail. And you're reading these papers and all this minutia, and it's like interesting stuff, but how could I possibly package this in a way that's going to work for somebody who doesn't know all this detail? 
And I'm just trying to say that I think that's my strength. I think I don't usually verbalize it, but I think I'm doing it right now. If I have something to offer, it's I can take a bunch of details. I can fashion them together in a way that it works with one particular episode. And then those details fashioned that way plug into the thing that we created in the last episode and so on. For whatever reason, I have practice or I have natural ability. I don't know, but there's that is necessary in science communication, and I feel like that's done regularly here, and it seems to be working. I'm saying that out loud because I think that's what's going to happen with Glenn's work here today. There's rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole, and I think that I, just like many of you, we'll dive in deeply to Glenn's world and we'll see all that detail and be very impressed. And at the same time go, how do I get back to the surface? I'm down here. I'm down here on my hands and knees in this, in this hole that I just found that was dug outside of Cheney, Washington. So you and I, and I guess I'll be the lead on this. We'll be trying to go deeply into this world, looking year by year in eastern Washington, and then try to, again, fashion something together that's going to have resonance with everybody, with an audience that won't be down at the level of detail that some of us will be with all this fine work by Glenn in Spokane. So another way to say it is, I've got some work to do between now and late December, and I'm going to be using Glenn's work as a guiding star, a guiding light, as I try to put together the next few letters, including Brett's in the Columbia River Gorge. So that's how we will finish. We'll go back, and I want to remind you then that, uh, of course, this, not of course, but most of what Glenn has for us with those Google Earth files is from the famous Eastern Washington Channel Scablands work. And some, but not all, of the Columbia River Gorge is plugged into Google Earth. Now, you heard my story. You heard my story at the beginning of this one about the University of Chicago and the library. I just fired off an email this morning asking if I could get some field notes from the, Google, the Columbia River Gorge years because you know one of my main interests is how much Eastern Washington field work did Brett's do before 1922? According to this, he didn't start working in the channeled scablands of Eastern Washington until Glenn's data points and his thumbtacks in 1922. Well, if you go to Google Earth uh, between now and the next episode, you're going to see some stuff in 1919 and 1920 where Brett's is in Eastern Washington. But if I can get more notebooks... If I can connect with more descendants of Brett's and somehow dust off some stuff that's maybe never been seen by anybody, that would be a fun thing to push. And there might be some storylines that come out of that as well. That's the whole idea. Okay, last thing we're doing is uh, you're going to give me a second to struggle here, uh, but I'm going to get to my photos. I want to show you, Glenn mentioned a guy named Joel a couple of times, and I did not mention Joel well, let's just, why not just bring it over? You can see behind the curtain here. Let me, let me hunt for this map by Joel. Where is it? I also have to organize my stuff before. Uh, hang on. Is this it? Yeah. This is it. Can I go full screen, please? What the H? There. Okay. So in addition to Glenn being inspired to do his Google Earth work, there have been this is another example of how things just bubble up with, with no idea that something's going to happen like this. So I was on vacation with Liz and some friends of ours in Corvallis, Oregon this August. And I got an email one morning. I remember running out to the living room and said, you're not going to believe what I just got. I got an email from this guy, Joel, in Sacramento. And he just made a beautiful map 
for the field season of 1922. You're like, how did Joel in Sacramento know where Brett was in 1922? It's the same thing. He he went to the typed field notes of Brett's from 1922, and instead of going into Google Earth, Joel has the skills to make a map that looks like this. And so Joel and Glenn and Brian and Ryan have all been co co collaborating, but the idea is that this kind of map, just for the first field season in the Channel Scablands, is amazing. Showing the rails that existed at that time, showing the walking routes that Brett's and his three grad students went. Um, he borrowed somebody's car, probably Thomas Large's car, for a part of this, but I'm not sure we know the details there. And so I want to include Joel in this story. And uh, that was 1922. And then back in August, Joel said, I'm just going to do a map like that for every uh, summer for the rest of the 20s for Brett's because I was so excited about the breadth of the map that I just showed you. And then I hadn't heard much from Joel <laughs> since then. So I, so I emailed Joel last night and I said, hey, have you been watching the series, Joel? He's like, oh, yeah, it's really fun stuff with Jerome and all this and Sky Cooley and Joel Gombiner. I said, uh, how's it been going with those maps? He says, I got three kids under the age of seven. I lost my momentum. It got too complicated. The next field season in 1923, Brett's is – doing a bunch of extra stuff and I was like trying to cram it all into one map and it wasn't as elegant as, as the 1922 map, which was just simply one, one month's worth of time. So, so Joel says, Oh, maybe I'll find some time, but probably not. The holidays are coming up. So understandably. So, you know, we all have varying amounts of spare time. And so occasionally there's things that bubble up that are really exciting, but you know, we all have limited amounts of time and some of us are artistic in nature and we just kind of lose our, our momentum. And so the, the project just kind of runs out of gas. The reason I share that is I wanted to involve Joel in this show, but also I'll say it one more time. I have no idea how many creative things are going to come out of today's episode, but I have a sneaking suspicion. There will be some very interesting ways to take all of this data and hard work by Glenn and take us in new directions. A toast to you. Here's to you for joining us today for episode I called Brett's Google Earth with Glenn Crookshank. Let me try that again. That wasn't so hard, was it? Here's to Glenn Crookshank for all of his time devoted to this project for free in his spare time, in his retirement years. And he has done it for all of us in this community. Here's to Glenn. Here's to everybody in your community, near and far, as we approach the holiday time. I don't see anything else I wanted to include. I'll see some of you in downtown Ellensburg at Randy Lewis's event this Saturday at 2 o'clock. Uh, for the rest of you, thank you. I've been receiving a bunch of viewer mail involving people from around the world making their colored maps, blue and orange and red. We'll save that for Sunday with Joel Gombiner when we talk more about marine isotope stages and the sediments at the mouth of the Columbia River. Thanks, everybody. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. See you on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific for episode J. J as in Joel Gombiner. Goodbye. See you Sunday.